some of the complications you've seen from sickle cell, from your, you know, just some of the yeah. I think the more people understand the kind of complications that can arise from sickle cell, they better understand that, how serious it is. Sure, yeah, yeah. So, of course, as we talked about earlier, red blood cells are a very important part of our, of our body. They deliver oxygen and they go everywhere because every part of your body needs oxygen. Your brain needs oxygen, your eyes need oxygen, your lungs need oxygen, your heart needs oxygen, your kidneys, your liver. And in a disease where oxygen delivery becomes the issue, the complications of sickle cell disease can basically be anything. And you can start from the top of the human body and work your way down. And you can name every complication from stroke to eye disease to pulmonary clots, pulmonary hypertension, acute chest syndrome, any place that these red blood cells are getting stuck, which is everywhere, you can have a complication. When it gets stuck in your liver, it causes hepatopathy. When it gets stuck in your spleen, you can have splenic sequestration. When it gets, uh, you know, when, when you have blood occlusion and lack of oxygen in your skin, you get skin ulcers. When you're a male with sickle cell disease, the sickle cells get stuck in your penis, you have priapism unwanted, uh, persistent, painful erection for four hours that has debilitated males with sickle cell disease who don't even want to talk about this problem because it's embarrassing to them, but devastating. Um, in a center where I take care of 800 children with sickle cell disease, I have seen every complication there is. This is the cruelest disease that somebody can have. It hides in the bushes and pops up when you least expect it. And it robs patients of normalcy in their life. And for us as physicians and providers to add more cruelty from the outside, again, is criminal. Um, so I guess the short answer is the list of complications is so long that we could talk about it for the next few days. I know, no, that's the, that's the thing with but sickle cell is that because people, people so little understand about um, the issues that when, when you start talking about it, you could go on for days because it's just so much to educate people about. The thing that when you talk about complication, I'm bringing you now about the mental side. We talk about the physical pain. You've just told us how bad the physical pain is. But one thing we, we neglect and I, myself and the victim of this as a sickle cell patient i always just thought um talked about my physical pain and i didn't know because i couldn't accomplish a lot in life i couldn't do what other people were doing i couldn't play sport i was i was bad in school i was um it was hard to keep a job i didn't know how that was destroying me on the other side but wow. pain is so big and we forget about the other pain. Could you tell yeah. me a little bit about the other side? Of yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, this is a biopsychosocial disease. Mm. And you're absolutely right. We completely neglect that pain is, of course, a biological problem, mm. but it has a huge psychological component. We have patients who have pain that's bad enough that they get post-traumatic stress disorder, right? PTSD, anxiety, worrying about when the, the guillotine is gonna drop on them again, right? At what point are they gonna have to go back into an emergency room? Depression, um, these are real big issues in sickle cell disease that honestly are number one neglected, but, but also healthcare systems and sickle cell providers don't have the resources to dedicate to properly caring for this biopsychosocial disease. A psychologist is probably a really important part of a sickle cell patient's care because you could trigger pain in yourself 
from your mind, right? Stress and anxiety can absolutely make your blood vessel constrict and can absolutely cause sickling. I've had to correct trainees time and time again. Well, they'll say, oh, this patient's in with pain, but he has finals next week. So yeah, he's probably just here to maybe get out of his exams. And then we have to have the conversation. Actually, you know, stress releases adrenaline and, and adrenaline causes blood vessels to constrict and, and then red blood cells get stuck and, and here you are. So yes, the psychological component is huge and very underrecognized. There's one other component of sickle cell disease care that is very much neglected and that's the care of sickle cell disease patients who are pregnant. Oh gosh, yes. Reproductive issues, fertility issues, and pregnancy and sickle cell disease are completely neglected and uh, something that we definitely need to address as a community. I know. It is um, a challenge. It's a challenge for hematologists, doctors as well, because they're just thinking about you. Right. To get the baby. Yeah. It's a challenge for maternity. They're thinking about the baby. They forget about you. So. Right. No, during my pregnancy, it was absolutely, it was, it was, it was the worst time. Let's just put it that way. It was the worst times of my life, and I, oh, probably that's why I gave an eight, eight years gap between the first one and the second one because I, every time I think about the pain and the trauma it cost me, I've always just said to myself, I don't think I could go through this anymore. And it was not just the sickle cell pain; it was just the lack of understanding between all components, on yeah. how, with me and how one thing led to a lover because. A doctor, some doctor with says that probably we should overdose her with iron or blood. And, and I understand it is the, an issue that needs to be looked at because more women should not be afraid of having babies because they have such Absolutely. Absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. On, and on a final note, because I wouldn't want to keep you, honestly, I could keep you here and we could talk. I'm about quite this. enjoying this conversation. <laughs> I really love to talk about sickle cell. Before, okay, before I get into the final bit, let me talk about your TEDx talk because I really sure. your TEDx talk. You talk about an artist. I can't remember his name, but you did mention an artist, and you said something about um, what led a 49, uh, 46 year old Haiti artist to be kicked out of the hospital in the dead of winter, led him to be joblessness um, and homelessness. That was a good start, and because as soon as I heard that, I thought. This is so true. You could be so good. I know myself, I am so good, but the moment I'm in hospital, I'm a different person. I'm no longer that Anne that is the person who's given everything to society. I'm now that Anne who is sick, who is so dependent, who's needy, who needs more things to get better. How can society make this a little bit better for the adults? Because it's really, really painful for us to deal with this kind of pain. That one minute where with this shining person, everyone wants a piece of us. The next minute, we're nothing. And it happens so fast. It literally happens so fast. You're giving it, you're this person waving to everyone. Next minute, you're just this quadly person who can't even drink water on your own. Right. How can we address this? So the artist that you're referring to, his name is Hertz Mazer. And Hertz is... Um now a good friend of mine. In fact, when I'm feeling um, low and I've had a tough day um, and I'm reconsidering my, my, my job choices, I call him and uh, talk to him about sickle cell disease. Um, and he's one of the most inspiring people I've ever met in my life. Um, you know, I, I, I say this in my TED talk, but one of the things that he said to me is very true said there's a lot of starting over in sickle cell disease. Yes. You're always starting over. You know, you build and build and build and then it just gets torn down and then you start over. I don't think there's an easy answer to what you're asking, but I can tell you that the voice, the collective voice of the sickle cell disease patient community right now, because of people like you, Anne, is not going unnoticed. Okay. It's not going unnoticed. There are some really exceptional, strong voices of sickle cell patients who are trying to change the way 
people are talking about them what in their presence or not in their presence right it's it, th this community is the most inspiring community i have ever met in my life sickle cell disease patients are the most resilient patients i've met in my life there's no bigger battle and time after time they come back wanting to change not only lives of their own but others and the ones that haven't come yet they're trying to make things better consistently you're part of that right and even in here in the united states we have people like cass trimnell and tiana wolford and uh, shamanica wiggins who are who are doing putting in this work too as long as people like you are around and showing that you are diamonds and every once in a while even a diamond needs to be scuffed and cleaned off right um but a diamond is a diamond in the end of the day and that's truly what you are um keep showing yourself interact with everybody while you're well be open about your illness one thing that my patients struggle with is sometimes sickle cell patients stigmatize themselves we talk about the stigma that others and society places on sickle cell patients, but sometimes we don't talk about the stigma that sickle cell patients put on sickle cell patients. Sometimes patients are hardest on themselves. And I'd like to remind people, the origin of sickle cell disease was from a desperate attempt at survival from malaria. When humanity was being devastated by malaria, a small group of individuals mutated a superpower called sickle hemoglobin that kept them alive. You are the progeny of those few individuals that allowed humanity to persist. This should be something we're celebrating. Humans adapting to an environment that was killing them is what resulted in sickle cell disease. Right. That is the most powerful thing I can think of. Right. You are a higher, you are a better, you're a superior model to us. Right. This is something that allowed human, humanity to continue. And with that frame, I think that we should start looking at sickle cell disease as something that's positive mm -hmm. instead of making our sickle cell patients feel like they are the mistake we're trying to avoid. Right. Every time we have the conversation about two patient, two parents with sickle cell trait having children, 25% chance you're going to have a sickle cell child. That's a mistake you want to avoid. Right. That's that's how the narrative goes. And that crawls into people's minds. Like I'm the mistake they're trying to prevent. And that sits deep, right? That cuts deep and that you hold on to that. Even subconsciously, you hold on to that. But that's not the case. This is this is a mutation that shows that you were able to adapt to an environment that was killing humanity and, and it should be looked at as a superpower. That is my God's honest opinion. I know people may not agree with that, but that's how I feel about it. And that's how you guys should feel about it. Yeah, that's how I feel about it. I mean, this is why I'm so, I'm so open about how my sickle cell has affected me. I'm not, I'm not, in that place where I want to stigmatize it because I know there's already enough people with sickle cell who are being told to keep quiet or else you won't get married or you won't get it right or you won't do this I always have right to, if I can do it then you can just have to put your mind to it and you can right now on that final note in terms of the equality and justice what do you think um, needs to be done in society to help the people with sickle cell to get better access to medical treatment? Oh man, it's a tough question. Uh, right? um, a tough one because um, I need to know what needs to be done. So I can... <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are no easy answers here, right? There are no easy answers to this. This is not something that we're gonna fix in a matter of days. No. This is going to be something that we're going to have to work at slowly and consistently to make a real difference.
I think that we have to really work on holding our health systems accountable for the way they treat sickle cell disease patients. And no decision about sickle cell disease should ever be made without sickle cell disease patients present at that table. No decision about you without you. I think that's a huge issue, right? That, that's the first thing. The second thing that I tell all my patients is don't ever let anybody tell you that you have not severe sickle cell disease. Mm -hmm. I want patients to erase that from their memory. Saying you have not severe sickle cell disease is giving a free pass to the healthcare system that already doesn't want to take care of you. You should be demanding every single resource that your healthcare system has when you have sickle cell disease. It shouldn't be, I don't need to see a doctor. My sickle cell disease is not bad. I don't have pain. I don't need to go see the kidney doctor. I don't have pain, so I don't need to go get my MRI. None of that. You want your insurance companies and your health systems, you want the NHS to pay for the MRI. You want the NHS to pay for the consultation from the nephrologist. You want them to pay for the new drug that just came out. You don't wanna give them a free pass saying I don't have severe sickle cell disease. Advocate for yourself, extract the resources. They're already limited, but this is the way that we're gonna make people care by ensuring that they are paying attention to us. Um, I think things are gonna get better now that we have new therapies coming. Uh, hopefully the UK picks up on some of these therapies quickly. Um, I think as, as we get more tools into the toolbox, it'll be a little bit easier to get some more attention. Mm. Um, but just keep pushing your health care system, keep pushing your doctors, don't let them make you feel better, right? Whether or not you have pain, sickle cell disease patients are dying 20 years, 30 years younger than they should be. Even if you didn't have a single pain episode in your life, right? Until we fix that, nobody should be saying they have not severe sickle cell disease. We should be pulling everything we can from every healthcare system that's out there. Wow. That is so true. And that is the, a card I will live with because I think as I, you know, as one gets older, one needs to also be aware that no, the lifespan with sickle cell is not great if you don't take care of your health. And if you For sure. work closely with your doctor on what needs to be done, so, you know, I'm really glad you said that final message because it just doesn't apply to anyone else. It also applies to myself. Getting older, I need to do the right thing so I, at least I can enjoy time with my kids. And that's all, when I have a 12-year-old girl in my clinic and I'm talking to her about a new drug, I always tell her, I'm not treating the 12-year-old version of you. No. I'm treating the 30-year-old version of you, the 40-year-old version of you. You taking this drug now might be the difference between you being 40 and being on dialysis or not being on dialysis. It's easy to get that false sense of security that you have this healthy, beautiful young child who's doing well. Why should I start a new medication? Why should they be on hydroxyurea? Why should they be on transfusions? But you have to remember that that 12 year old is, the damage of sickle cell disease started from the time they were born and it's building slowly. And it'll show its face at some point. And, and when it does, you want it to be as late as possible in life. I like that, it's true. The damage of sickle cell starts from the day we're born. It yep. starts and it starts and it, it, go, it goes on slowly, slowly. And it because again, it's an invisible disease, we can't see it. So automatically you just think you're fine. But when people, my doctor always used this keyword, when they did an autopsy on a sickle cell patient, in what he saw, he said that was one of the, biggest insight of that he's seen in his life and I thought and you better take care of yourself do what you yeah. can to make sure because 
you know, to go to hospital and for them to say they're looking for your vein. Imagine if you were in a worse off position where right. car accident and they can't even find your veins. That is not good. That is not something right. you want to be thinking about. So I think everyone with sickle cell should listen to this bit about only your own sickle and don't let it be um, decision made on a side table where you're not part of it. Own it when a doctor is talking to you about what you're going through. Listen to what they're saying and understand. Go research, ask questions, so you better understand. Wow, Doctor Ama, I could stay here and talk to you because this um, this knowledge is definitely worth it. Not just for me, but for many others out there. I'm sure I'll be reaching out to you again to talk about sickle cell in children with sickle cell to understand more on how we can have help specifically kids with sickle cell. I really do thank you for your time today and I wish you all the best. The pleasure was mine and thank you so much for inviting me. I want to remind people, find me at Dr. Z Sickle Cell and we have a podcast called Cheat Codes, a sickle cell podcast. And you're going to be hearing from me, Anne, because I'm going to invite you to come on as a guest. Oh, that's lovely. Because I got to learn, you got to learn about me, but I didn't get to learn about you. So I'm going to invite you to my podcast so that we can learn about Anne. Thank you so much. I look forward to joining you anytime to tell you all about my sickle cell journey. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care.